development at NFEC. So um, what I wanted to do was to just give you a little bit of a, a slice of the past. Um, we owe so much to um, our predecessors, the pioneers, the people who um, came before us, who started our organization back in 1972, just right after the EPA was founded. So just as the environmental movement was in its infancy. And um, we have Ann Lowry, Ronnie Wacker, Paul Stoutenberg, Ruth Oliva, and Howard Meinke um, to thank for this wonderful organization that has been doing good things for 50 years now. So what I'd like to do is just read, you, read to you because I would think that most of you probably don't know about the origins of our organization. Um, it's interesting. Uh, this is from an excerpt from our 30th anniversary celebration back when we were able to have parties and celebrate in person. And hopefully we'll be able to do that again sometime soon. But Ronnie wrote this, uh, NFEC celebrating 30 years of success. And she started out by saying, it seems like only yesterday, was it really 30 years ago, that a little band of concerned South holders met in Paul Stoutenberg's living room to see what they could do to protect our fragile wetlands from further development. They called themselves the Eastern Long Island Wetlands Preservation Association. Meanwhile, across town in Mattituck, a small group of neighbors was battling a multi-million dollar industrial proposal for Riverhead that was to include a deep water port, motel marinas, an aircraft assembly factory, a nuclear powered desalinization plant, and some other insanely high tech enterprises. They quickly discovered that it was all smoke and mirrors. What was really going on was a full fledged sand mine operation. Cubic yards of the James Port Hills were being shipped by barge to Connecticut. Jetties built to accommodate the barges were undermining the Mattituck cliffs, threatening the homes behind them. The Mattituck residents formed the North Fork Preservation Society. Then, recognizing the enormity of their fight, they joined forces with the Wetlands Group, giving birth to the North Fork Environmental Council. The fledgling NFEC helped overturn the scheme to turn North Fork farmland into a major industrial region of the Northeast, but other fights soon loomed. One hustler after another, attracted to the open space, proposed various projects, including an oil refinery and even, at one point, eight nuclear power plants. Not one, eight. So began the assault on the natural resources of the North Fork, which is still going on 30 years later. And as we know, it's still going on 50 years later. Um, what I do want to um, mention to you, and this is part of um, one of the success stories, is that um, that property in Jamesport where the sand was being mined is now preserved, it's protected. It's the um, Halleck State Park Preserve. So we are very fortunate to have that, um, that open space protected in perpetuity. Okay. So that gives you a little bit of background and um, let you know that uh, <laughs> we're still fighting the good fight. Mark, are, are yeah. you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready here. You're ready to continue. Ready to continue. Thank you. Um, of course, the things we are doing are not a band of three or five or even 50. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be more than 50 um, or 150 soon. Um, our partners, a lot of our partners are on this call tonight as panelists, and we appreciate their efforts, their contributions, their expertise. Certainly, I will never learn, I, I will never learn what these people have learned collectively over time, and that's why we have partners. And some of these are going to be new to you, and I realized when I was putting the slide together that we're going to need another slide soon, which is very exciting. 
The next, uh, welcome to tonight's lecture, the biological control of hairy root disease on hydroponically grown tomatoes using pseudonym. Oh, sorry, that was last night. Oh, so sorry. Uh, but we do, we do have a contest tonight, which is real. Um, I'm going to send out a book to the first person who can, oh, how are we going to do this, Dawn? We don't have chat. Oh, no. Okay, we'll, we'll figure this out, but I'd like to offer a book to the first person who guesses who wrote the paper, Hydrodynamic Modeling to Integrate Light Modeling into the Impact Prediction Process. And of course, um, employees and subsidiaries of NFBC are not eligible for this contest. Um, I guess we'll, uh, we'll figure that out as we go along. Uh, I'm going to start uh, again briefly. Uh, the, 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 bio, the, the bios that I have for everyone here tonight is pages. So I'm going to try to be brief and introduce people. Most of you know who they are to begin with, but some things you may not know about them. Debbie's, some of Debbie's most important life work has been at the North Fork Environmental Council itself. Starting as its sole employee in 1996, Debbie has served as an environmental educator and advocate, coordinating volunteers, managing the budget, raising funds, working with local businesses and government for this nonprofit agency. She helped to spearhead the original campaign to enact the Community Preservation Fund, ensuring that the North Fork would maintain its open spaces and agricultural land. Debbie is a past executive director and is currently the program director at NFEC and one of my mentors. Debbie. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, How that's you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so I'm on. I'm talking briefly about successes. Is that is that where we're at? Yeah, the, the oh, question okay. I'm going to ask everybody in order is uh, what worked and what did not and why? That's the important thing that we've learned from our uh, experience. Okay, briefly. well, um, I think we all know that it takes a, a band of uh, committed um, people who were willing to work together either as part of an organization or as a group or coalition of organizations to make things happen. Um, and Mark, you mentioned the Community Preservation Fund and that was um, one of the first successes that I experienced coming on back in the late 90s. Um, we worked together with um, a lot of other organizations and um, as a result, uh, we got the 2% transfer tax um, in place. It's been renewed a number of times and it has preserved um, thousands of acres of land. So we are very um, happy that uh, that's still going. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of land preservation. Um, looking forward um, regarding land preservation, I would just absolutely love to see more open space preservation because we need to, um, we really need to protect habitat. We need to protect farmland. We need our um, critical open space as well. So that is something that um, I think we all need to um, try and preserve as much open space as we possibly can. It's also important for um, recharge of our groundwater. Um, you've probably seen um, somewhere over the past years um, a bunker, bumper sticker that says um, save what's left. Well, that came out of NFEC. <laughs> I would say that that's been um, successful in terms of, um, you know, just people uh, being reminded of a message and being reminded of an effort and, uh, and reminding them of how special this place is and uh, what we need to preserve and protect. Um, success, uh, if you look around, um, you know, we have, we have protected an awful lot. Uh, one of the huge disappointments at NFEC was um, losing the battle um, to Tanger Mall. Um, that was something that we fought very hard and vigorously um, to try and either scale back the project or we knew it was going to open the floodgates and it literally did. We all know that. Um, we thought that it would affect the downtown area of, of Riverhead, the main street, the mom and pop stores in Riverhead, and it certainly did. 
Um, we're going through a downtown revitalization um, plan now, but we probably didn't have to do that. We could have kept that um, downtown um, with its vitality all along. Um, in the beginning, we, uh, Gwen, Gwen Schroeder, who's going to be up next, um, she and I both uh, worked together as staff at NFEC, and um, we were very much involved in um, getting people to understand what was going on um, with Plum Island. Um, Plum Island at the time, there were some major um, safety and security concerns. And we worked very hard to get the public to understand what was going on because at that time the federal government was actually proposing a biosafety level four facility for that property. Um, as it turns out, the federal government decided to go ahead and build another facility, a biosafety level four in, um, at, uh, in Kansas, Manhattan, Kansas. And now we're in the throes of trying to uh, protect most of the open space on that island and perhaps use the rest of it for um, for research or um, maybe some other academic um, pursuits. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, I mean, there's just so many things that we can talk about. Uh, you know, we've we've been very much involved in uh, um, just education, advocacy, climate change, uh, plastic reduction and elimination, um, pesticide reduction, um, success. We've seen lots of home homeowners leaving the leaves and um, using more um, more of the best management practices when it comes to maintaining their their landscapes and their lawns. Um, we've been successful in getting some legislation in place on the state level and on the county level. And thank you, Legislator Krupski, for um, you know the reduction that's in place as far as um, plastic use uh, on an institutional level. That's great. Um, and uh, one other thing, um, back to the beginning, when I first came on board, um, you can thank NFEC basically for only having one McDonald's and one fast food restaurant, basically one standalone fast food restaurant in um, South Hole Town. Because when McDonald's decided that they wanted to come in, NFEC really rallied the troops and actually um, fought the good fight against South Hole Town and was able to get legislation on the books to, to um, prevent any standalone fast food formula restaurants um, to be built again in South Hold. So I think that's, that kind of covers some of what we've done <laughs> to give a you lot, a little Debbie. bit of background. Yeah, that's a lot. Let me uh, move on to uh, Gwyn. Um, and this is the roster, and I, I see Kevin is, um, multiplying three minutes times six people before him so he can go out for coffee. Um, Gwyn Schroeder uh, is now the Vice President of North Fork Audubon Society, another one of my mentors. She is a uh, past board member of NFEC, and because of environmental advocacy being so highly lucrative, she maintains a J job as legislative aide to Suffolk County Legislator Al Krupski. Go ahead, Gwyn. I scared her off. When you're on mute. You'd think I'd have the Zoom thing down by now. But anyway, um, so I just want to congratulate NFEC. Um, I have very warm and uh, feelings towards the organization. As Mark mentioned, uh, you know, uh, while I worked for NFEC for nine years, I started as a volunteer and I just wouldn't go away, so they hired me. And it was a change for me because I was a nurse. And so this was a whole new world. Um, so I learned a lot and I got a little emotional seeing, um, you know, Howard, particularly, and Ann Lowry, they were my mentors and they were lovely people. And I think what worked is when you get a bunch of passionate people that really care about an issue and they're ready to go to the mat, good things happen. And um, Debbie mentioned the CPF. Before my time, there was the Pine Barrens Act. Um, you know, Suffolk County had the first land preservation program, I believe, in the country. 
And since that time, we've preserved hundreds of acres, both at the county level and the town level. Um, people kind of understand um, how important and, and special this place is. Uh, I, I am involved in a couple of groups and I'm like many of you here tonight, I feel like I'm among friends. I've had the, uh, the pleasure and honor to work with you. I'm, I feel like I know all of you or many of you, and you're the kind of people that show up and and get active. And I think what works is when people, coalitions work, organizing works, having, getting involved works, um, watching what your government is doing. And I'm sort of in, and I'm, many of us in this room have worked for government and then worked in the uh, nonprofit sector, um, watching what elected officials do and paying attention to the details, I think, is important because, you know, um, you know how we influence policy is important, and um, and for like the general citizen, like especially in the, the time that we're in now, which is kind of such a strange time, um, I, I think it's so important that the average citizen gets involved, and it should be part of your daily routine. You know, I'm going to brush my teeth, wash my face. What can I do today? Because we're up against tremendous um, uh, pressures. Climate change is, um, you know, it's the biggest issue of our time, of any time, perhaps. And um, but I look back and I look at the people in this room, and I'm encouraged. You know, whether it's you know, I see Kevin and I see Joyce from the Panic Estuary Program, and I think about, and they may talk about this like the fish ladder projects, like it took forever, but they're happening, right? And I think the key is that when you're an advocate, particularly, you really have to take a long view because your successes, it's an arduous process to get there. And I think if we didn't have passionate people who are committed and smart, that um, we'd be in a worse place. I'm still not completely optimistic about our future, but I'm hopeful because of, folks like you all. Thanks very so, much, Gwen. I'd like to move on to uh, Louise Harrison. Another mentor of mine, Louise is a conservation biologist and has been an environmentalist from a very early age. Her life has been spent, I think, in all of the uh, possible aspects of environmental work, government, nonprofit, and civics. And is the corporate realm included in this too, Louise? Yes, for one year. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, and at that that was an early job with Academic Press, uh, where I was an editor of biological treatises, and I was working for the man. Um, that was the last time I did that, but uh, that was very educational. And um, first, first of all, thank you for inviting me to to speak and I just want to say that this invitation for tonight has driven me into quite a bit of thought about my journey to the present day and um, I'm humbled by this request. I'm truly humbled by the magnitude of our worldwide crisis of climate change, uh, which we all know is threatening to overpower all systems and um, cause cascading effects. And I wish that my 42 years of experience here on Long Island um, had somehow equipped me to make a big difference in that realm. Um, I know we are all trying, and I think the answer is that we are all trying. And uh, we've, got, we've got those of us here tonight, and we can magnify that by many others. Um, but that preoccupied me. And uh, rather than go through um, a litany of the things that I've been involved in over the years, I thought what I would try to do is find common threads of um, what, what might have worked um, in some of the things I, I worked on. Um, but briefly, I have worked for three different state agencies in New York, the County of Suffolk, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. EPA, um, uh, two different not-for-profits, uh, academic press, um, and have had some uh, work with New York City as well. Um, and it's ranged from uh, 
land protection, wetlands protection, environmental education, uh, environmental planning, estuary planning, um, heritage area planning. Um, common thread of it all is my, my passion for environmental protection and wanting to make things work. I've, I've realized the absolute need for connections and coalitions. Mm -hmm. But I've always had a strong empathy for animals and I think from the age of five, I wanted to protect them. I know from the age of five, I wanted to protect them. And I, as I grew older, I realized habitat protection was how I was gonna be able to do that. So I've tried to weave certain elements through all my work, um, believing also that education is important. I honestly believed that if you educated people, uh, they, would, they would see I'm not so sure I see it that way anymore. I still believe strongly in education, mm -hmm. but now I'm learning and I think we're all learning that um, there are passions that run high in human beings and um, self-serving passions, political passions, uh, passions of greed. Um, this, these are really tough things for us to work against uh, or work with. And I'm wondering if, if we need to find more empathy for the people we have been opposing. Um, because the, the jig is up and we've got to make some changes really fast. So what has worked? Um, one of the things that has worked in coalition building against certain developers, I have found um, is not demonizing the person but demonizing the activity. In other words, just uh, referring to the developer and not naming names. I think that actually is quite helpful. Um, I've also found that no matter how old a person is, if you can get them out in the natural environment and get them to connect, their heart opens. The opening of the heart leads people to actually see in ways they've never seen before. And that is one of the things I've found most satisfying in my life is opening people's eyes to seeing things that they didn't think was out there. Um, noticing things that now they want to, they care about and want to protect. Mm -hmm. um, I got heavily involved in enforcement at one point and I realized there's not enough of it. Uh, it, takes, it takes courage. It takes tenacity. It takes it takes uh, the blood out of you. But um, I feel we need more of it. Um, and I will never uh, regret my early childhood experiences out in nature and the field experiences that I've had um, in academic training and throughout my work. Um, now, what didn't work, and this includes some of my own failures. But globally, we've all ignored the warnings about climate change and loss of biodiversity. And we've had very little change in behavior. Um, I think about that a lot. I think about our economic system and how capitalism is based on endless growth and exploitation and waste. And that concerns me, but I'm in it. I'm really concerned about money and politics corruption and backroom deals. And I've seen some of the projects that I've cared most about being lost to corruption and backroom deals. And that's something I don't know how to address. I think I underestimated how strong people's political alliances can be. One of the things, and I don't wanna cry when I say this, but I honestly have to say this to all of you. One of the things that's distressed me the most about the environmental movement is how we turn on each other. There's no room for this, okay? Forget the factions. No more factions, no more finger pointing. We need every single one of us. I don't care if you have personal differences with somebody, get over it. We need all of us here, okay? That's, I feel very strongly about that. 
I think that we have had a lack of inclusiveness, um, most especially with indigenous groups who were here first for 10,000 years and knew a little bit about this place. Um, we've only been here about 400 and change and we've made waste really fast. Um, and I would say in general, uh, as a society, we wait until things are broken. You know, we have an Endangered Species Act. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Get it? We waited until they were endangered. Um, same thing with wetlands. And now our society thinks that if it's not in an act, which was a last minute Hail Mary, that it's not worth protecting, like a native forest with oak trees. We need an Oak Forest Protection Act. Um, we need to protect entire natural systems. Uh, we all know here that we depend on them and, uh, and we need a complex of these systems. So we've got to figure out how to do all that and address climate change. Um, but let's stick together, guys. And uh, that's the end of my little um, pious lecture. And I apologize for my attitude. <laughs> I didn't mean to be that way. It's, it's all noble, Louise, and, and I, I think what is driving, driving us for this coming year is going to be doing exactly that, forming coalitions. We're not, some of us are not even competing for money right now. We don't have a grant writer. So we're not competing for, so let's see if we have a niche. Let's see if we have a, a function within the organism, within the system, in order to complement each other. And that's what we'll be doing this, uh, this year. Um, I have one more thing. Of course. And I, because uh, you just reminded me of something I forgot to say, which is that the most successful efforts I've been in have been exactly that, where the diversity of individuals was there and each person was able to capitalize on their own personal strengths. Yeah, absolutely. And I watched that with the, uh, the Plum Island Coalition. I was so blown away by you invited me to all of those, uh, the envisioning process. Oh my God, it was just, it was enlightening. I'd never been into anything like that before, and, and we need to do that again for something else much bigger. Uh, Joyce Novak, uh, her, Dr. Novak's science career began in 1999, when she spent a year monitoring groundwater in New York City for the US Geological Survey. Her experience since then spans projects and teaching appointments in New York and Europe. The scope of her work has included marine, coastal, and freshwater projects. Joyce came to the New England Interstate Water Pollution uh, sorry, I forgot the last word on that uh, program, perhaps, in 2018 from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. is now the executive director of the Peconic Estuary Partnership, not the program, but the partnership, which has her involved in too many projects to name. Welcome, Joyce. Thanks, Mark. Um, I will just caveat that with an update. Um, I am now at Stony Brook University. Um, the estuary program is happily housed in SOMAS at Stony Brook University, um, where we face a bright future and lots of growth. So that is an update in 2021. Um, I, and for answering your question, um, I think I'd like to think big about what worked. And for me, as a child who was born in the 70s, uh, the Clean Water Act stands as potentially one of the most influential um, pieces of legislation, I think, environmentally that um, has has shaped the future um, for all of us. Uh, yes, do we enact things too late? Probably, um, but I can't vision. I have no memory of direct illegal discharges to water because by the time I was of age, they were, you know, uh, on their way of being cleaned up and handled, or the cleanup was underway. Um, you know, I, I think we've all been to LaGuardia Airport at low tide, and, and we know how important the Clean Water Act was in, you know, helping to bring those changes about. Um, Self-servingly in the 80s, the National Estuary Programs were born out of the Clean Water Act. Um, in the 90s, uh, under Obama, that led to the Waters of the United States rule, which expanded um, to ephemeral pools and, and um, seasonal pools uh, in the protection of, you know, more expanding definitions of, of what that covers. Um, and, and so many uh, coalitions and movements and humans were moved to action through it that I, I think that it was really fundamental in how the environmental movement uh, unfolded 
since the 70s, uh, how, how many knock-on effects of smaller groups it empowered um, to be able to make a change or a legal challenge to something um, that wasn't there before. So um, I think for me, that's the biggest um, win. Uh, certainly on the east end of Long Island, the community preservation fund is unparalleled um, in, in what it's accomplished um, with land preservation. Um, uh, people are trying to model it and have modeled it in other places. Um, it's been really influential um, as a tool to be able to preserve uh, natural spaces. Um, so for sure, those two things stand out. Um, our biggest challenges, um, I don't know, ourselves probably, um, you know, and we keep coming around to the notion that uh, we've known about climate change and um, we've really, truly failed um, at taking the steps that we needed to take. Um, scientists were talking about this decades ago. Um, nobody listened until Al Gore made a movie and wrote a book. Um, and even then only a small fraction of people listened. Um, and in some ways, maybe that served as a catalyst to divide um, more than it should have. Um, and we see this today. I often think with the division that exists, would the Clean Water Act have passed today? Um, and I don't think it would have. You know, I, I think that we've come to a place um, where we've allowed the drive for economics and development to override our need um, to work together on anything. So um, I don't think it's all bad news. I, I think a movement is happening um, where people are beginning to realize this, whether they are coalesced around climate change or clean water or habitats, um, they are starting to come together more and more, um, small groups merging into bigger groups, um, learning how to use legal tools to make challenges. Um, all of those things are evolutions uh, of a movement. I think that things like the Clean Water Act have, have given the strength to be able to do. So, um, I, you know, that's my two cents. Um, I, I'll also say that we don't stand alone ever. I mean, even on here, I can say, you know, I stand on the shoulders of Alison Branco who came before me, right? And so we all have a mentor or a person or a group that um, I think fosters a, a bigger movement. Um, and and I, I think we'll get there whether I'll see it in my lifetime, I don't know, but I, I think that we are moving, um, we're bouncing back from a darker place um, into a place of light. Uh, moving on to uh, Kevin McAllister, I, I, I dug around the internet um, to find pictures of some of you people. It was uh, quite, the, quite the task. Kevin holds undergraduate degrees in natural resources conservation and marine, marine biology, as well as a master's of science in coastal zone management. His professional experience spans 30 years working in government consultancy and the nonprofit sectors of environmental protection. Uh, I have a picture of him on his weekend job. He's uh, the founding president of Defend H2O and coastal scientist. We're grateful to have his voice addressing the physical and ecological implications of climate change here locally. Kevin always reminds us of the appropriate responses to sea level rise and to ensure that our region's beaches, wetlands, and other natural resources remain sustainable. Kevin. Thank you, Mark, for the uh, introduction and congratulations to NFEC for 50 years. Um, of course, uh, Debbie and I go back many years and compatriots in the cause and congratulations for all the milestones. Um, Mark, you introduced some of my background. I want to uh, share a little more details because I think it's shaped who I am now and really, I guess, my belief and my approach to environmental protection. Um, you, you cited my, my academic training. Um, you know, I guess toward the end of it, I moved to South Florida to uh, finish up school down there and subsequently started getting employed. I uh, served as a, a marine turtle biologist, uh, a field biologist with a consulting firm. Uh, I will not trade those two years for anything uh, in the world because I, I learned the, I guess I call it the waltz between developers, uh, agencies, and, and their mouthpieces, you know, in some cases the attorneys or, or the environmental consultants uh, pushing the limits on wetlands. Um, 
I think uh, it was mentioned endangered species, uh, you know, dealing with a, a lot of the uh, species down in South Florida with massive development and only, you know, really being asked to suppress information. So, um, you know, that molded me to get out of that business quickly. And I thought the answer was government for me. I subsequently moved into Palm Beach County for more than a decade, um, working in um, coastal protection as well as the permitting realm. So I, I, uh, I guess, have seen the permits, had drafted the permits, I understand the process. Um, I returned to Long Island in 98. Uh, I was very excited to take the role of Peconic Baykeeper, uh, which at the time was South Hold based. Uh, I guess I started to learn really from uh, some degree from John Cronin, the Hudson River Keeper, as well as uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. as to what the Waterkeeper movement was about. And ultimately, uh, I found that it, it certainly fit my perspective of things. I, I thought the, um, you know, the, the process was a bit gained uh, and that there had to be real vigilance in resource protection. Um, I guess for my own professional accomplish, accomplishments in, you know, in that role and subsequently, I feel very good. I, I spearheaded uh, no discharge zones for the Peconic Estuary as well as the South Shore Estuary. Uh, both processes took about four years, a, a great deal of organizing, education, uh, bringing it all together with the document and, you know, for the uh, submittal of the actual petition. So, uh, you know, by virtue of uh, that work, again, both uh, estuaries are at least uh, protected from vessel discharges uh, up until 2002 for the Peconics, um, you know, that was very permissible. And, you know, I guess, uh, you know, knowing waste is waste, you know, the notion that we discharge it into a Sag Harbor or elsewhere, you know, just had to end. Um, in uh, 2005, with my work uh, on the South Shore, uh, at the time, the Forge River blew up with a harmful algal bloom. And that was really the first, not the first algal bloom per se, but uh, the first time it really came into the uh, attention of the media and to the, you know, the public at large. And from that, I think, uh, based on my training and, and just recognition that uh, wastewater was a big influence on these algal blooms and water quality degradation, you know, ultimately starting to, um, I'll say, advocate and, and uh, educate and being, um, you know, tireless about it and persistent. Uh, you know, for many years, I was a lone voice on this. And I'm, I'm pleased to say 11 years later, you know, now this process has taken off. Uh, we have a responsible government in Suffolk County that is taken up uh, sewage management and is very serious about the future of it. So uh, another important accomplishment. And lastly, um, you know, in, I guess, uh, 2008 thereabouts, uh, Suffolk County uh, vector control, which, you know, I, I guess has been a nemesis over the years because I, I just don't subscribe to the practices of wholesale pesticide applications and wetland manipulations uh, but they had an ambitious plan uh, to dredge 660 miles of mosquito ditches in Suffolk County, uh, primarily for stormwater conveyance, because this is in their permits, uh, and ultimately by, uh, you know, challenging that, that permit, uh, we were successful in, in having it quashed. Uh, so that went away, uh, and, you know, luckily uh, wetlands, uh, to the extent being uh, did not incur further insult by uh, the bombardier, which is literally a machine with a cutter head that, by the way, uh, macerates mud turtles, spotted turtles, uh, overwintering in these wetlands. Um, you know, Joyce had mentioned as, as far as, uh, I guess, the, you know, what, what has worked, and I will resonate, uh, the Clean Water Act. And again, the three uh, accomplishments that I cited, and there's been others, but it all comes down to enforcing a very sound and, and uh, forthright environmental law, the Clean Water Act, and uh, whether it be the uh, Drinking Water Act, Clean Water Act on wetlands, uh, again on these discharges, uh, these laws uh, allowed my organization to actually pursue these initiatives, uh, you know, on a I'll say a, uh, a friendly side and organizing side with the no discharge zones, but then clearly on the adversarial side when 
you start suing the state of New York for illegal discharges from sewage from their parks, um, you know, as well as some, some of the other uh, municipalities. So, you know, litigation, I guess, for me and the organization has been an important tool and it, it does wrap around the Clean Water Act. So without uh, the federal law and the, and the state and the local laws, you know, it, it doesn't give us the grounds uh, to adequately defend. And I guess where the real challenges lie ahead, and uh, again, another point that uh, maybe uh, Joyce had made on, um, well, I may be mixing, uh, but the, you know, the politics and the financials, um, you know, I think the, you know, the financial push has affected political thinking. And I, I get frustrated because, you know, we're not always dealing with the facts and the science. Uh, there's so much other noise that comes in and you know, uh, a great deal at times disappointment uh, based on uh, decisions that are made that are you know, uh, at times really pandering to special interests. Uh, and I will resonate this lastly, Mark, for, <laughs> for your favor, but um, you know, if, if there, the sky is falling, it is the encapsulation of our estuaries with seawalls. And that is happening incrementally uh, I just shared a, a, a Newsday publication that was uh, reporting on a, a proposed seawall uh, in Smithtown on Long Island Sound, a walkable beach, and the intent is to uh, basically uh, retain sediment that is sloughing off of the bluff to protect tennis courts. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we willing to uh, surrender public resources, the public trust doctrine, another law that has to be enforced, unfortunately has not uh, been to date, but again, surrendering these public resources for uh, private interests, and, and I say not. And it all comes down to what Gwen had said earlier, uh, really enlisting people, getting a movement of participation because you know we don't all have to be eloquent at the at the uh, podium uh, with our three minutes, but it's really important that we are standing arm to arm behind these issues to demonstrate uh, you know strength and, and solidarity, uh, so we can affect positive outcomes from the decision makers. So I, I think you know there's a lot of challenges ahead, but uh, you know. It, we, we do have to come together because uh, you know, united, uh, we stand divided, we clearly fall. And I, I will say, uh, lastly, on a, I'll say a, um, a disappointment and or uh, I have not accomplished it as a, as a person or organization and as really addressing the methoprene applications over these salt marshes. And again, the reasons that I cited, but I think largely because there just hasn't been the critical mass uh, of the public, uh, other environmentalists, to really weigh in on this strongly to, again, uh, persuade uh, and influence our decision makers to do the right thing. So thank, thanks for the extra time, Mark. That's all right. It, we'll just, um, we're doing fine. Thank you so much. Um, Allison, Frank, um, Allison Franco, Dr. Franco, I'm sorry, I had trouble finding a picture of you for a while and I wasn't sure why but uh, she's the Acting Director of Climate Adaptation, which is one of the titles that I don't see a lot of, especially around here, but I'm glad for that. Allison has worked in academia where she participated in numerous research projects involving the ecology of seagrass ecosystem, including habitat mapping, ecological assessments of estuarine and topical, tropical seagrass ecosystems under intense eutrophication pressure. As lead oceanographer at Worley Parsons in Western Australia, Allison led several projects to predict the impacts of dredging operations on temperate and tropical primary producer habitat. Allison has also developed monitoring and managing pro management programs for coastal developments and to integrate light modeling into the impact prediction process. She's a past director of what was then the Peconic Estuary Program and is yet another valuable partner with NFPC. Allison. Thanks for that, Mark. Uh I would love to know where you pulled all of those old nuggets out of. That's great. That, that photo, that photo, by the way, is the Nature Conservancy's new chief scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, not me, but that's okay, because you all get to see my face. Um, so I too want to congratulate NFEC on 50 years. It's really amazing uh, to see an organization with that kind of staying power, especially one that's uh, a nonprofit. So that's great. Um, so I have a lot of similar sentiments to what others have said, so I'm going to do my best to sort of add a little bit. Um, you know, I think 
I think in terms of what works and what what evidence we have of what works, obviously we've all talked about land protection because I think that's really the big victory that we all can claim on Long Island in terms of environmental protection. And I would say what we're learning now is that, you know, there's still more work to do there. We can't check that box, we're not finished. Also, I think it's, it's critical, it's necessary, but not sufficient, I think is what we're seeing. This, this sort of, um, the paradigm when the environmental movement started was really to protect the nature from the people. And so it was all about, you know, sort of walling it off, protecting it, keeping it away from people, not letting people mess it up. And I think that can only get you so far because you can't, you can't protect it all, obviously. We can't kick all the people off the island. So the way that our movement is starting to evolve, and I think this is certainly happening, I think most of the organizations represented here tonight, certainly mine, have started to make this sort of transition to where we're really looking at the nature of people as a more holistic system, trying to help people understand how important nature is to their own personal life every single day, um, and trying to sort of work with people to take care of nature going forward. We have a lot of work to do on that, but I think that's sort of the, the evolution that we've seen in this movement over the last 50 years. And that's really the way I think of the future is to include people with nature, not try to separate them, not protect nature from people anymore, but really look for this future. I hate to quote TNC's cheesy uh, vision statement, but really a future where people and nature thrive together going forward. Um, I think, you know, of course, the Community Preservation Fund is a great example of of how to how to kind of get these things done. Um, and I think, as others have said, the partnership of many organizations was super critical to getting that off the ground and keeping it keeping it alive and successful and growing over time. Um, and I think that is absolutely a really important secret. Um, you know, Kevin mentioned how the Baykeeper organization likes to sue the state and, you know, the Nature Conservancy almost never sues anybody. Um, it really does take sort of all kinds of organizations to make these things work. Some people are great at the impassioned speech. Some people are really good with the spreadsheet behind the scenes. And we really do need all these different kinds of approaches in order to make things happen. And I would say recently, the best example of that is our push to clean up the pollution from our septic systems. I think what really has made that so successful is all the organizations on the island and not just environmental organizations, you know, it's businesses also, I think the press even has gotten on board, making sure that these messages get out there. But it's the environmental groups all speak in the same language, using the same messages, all kind of rowing in the same direction is what has been responsible for all the regular people who don't normally know anything about nitrogen uh, and all sept how septic systems work and all of that. I mean, the number of strangers who can explain to me how their septic system works now is phenomenal. And that's because we all got together and said, we're all gonna focus, we're all gonna make this happen. We're gonna use the same messages and get everybody moving. And that's why I've had so much success getting policies and politicians and all of those folks getting it done. So I really do think, you know, like Louise said, it takes all the groups, it takes all the different types of organizations working together to make these things happen. Um, and I think another really important thing is that all of this great work, all of the advocacy, the lawsuits, all of these things can't happen if they're not backed by really good science. Um, and I think on Long Island, we've been really fortunate that a lot of the environmental activities that have gone on have been backed by really good science. And I think we can't forget that when we get wrapped up in the advocacy stuff, we have to remember, we have to just leave a little piece of the pie over there for the scientists, because that is what really feeds into um, the information that we need to then go do our job to be able to protect the environment. So those are my three things. It's really about um, the partnerships, the science, um, and kind of evolving our perspective to, to stop protecting land from people and really thinking of people as part of the system. That was wonderful. Thank you, Allison. Um, we're going to move into Sid Bale, and, and there's a different perspective here, certainly. Um, but I was uh, just started working with Sid about a year ago with the, the Town of Riverhead Comprehensive Plan. Um, I, I'm noticing the cake there, Sid. It, it says 80 years. You, you haven't been with the Civic for 80 years, I don't think. Is that correct? Oh, he's just, he's cursing me out here. 
<laughs> longer, much longer. longer. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the part of the civics? Sid, you, you've been an environmentalist certainly a long time, the way I hear you speak. Um, what works and what doesn't as far as the uh, civics? Well, um, you know, I'm really humbled by, you know, some of the folks in, in this room, you know, who are really uh, uh, impressive environmental credentials. Um, I'm, um, I kind of dabble in it <laughs> rather than, than an expert. And uh, my involvement in uh, civic affairs really started uh, in 1974 when I moved to Wading River. Nice, quiet little community. I figure, what the heck can happen here? Well, it's been the focus of a lot of things. Um, tremendous development pressures um, that threatened to destroy uh, the things that uh, represented uh, so much of the characteristics that people admired in, in Wading River, et, et cetera. Um, so, um, I learned some things, some general things, and over the years, I've gotten credit for a lot of things because I was involved in a lot of issues. And I say I was there. Have you ever seen the movie Zelik? With the the uh, <laughs> the Woody Allen movie? Yeah, that's someone nodding their head there. What happens is this mysterious character, uh, Arnold Zelik, I think was is his name, and what happens? They use some great trick photography and everything like that. And it doesn't matter what the historical event in the 20th century, Zelik happens to be there somewhere in the background, you know, you recognize. And that's what I feel like sometimes, because sometimes uh, I, I've gotten credit for really, uh, and in fact, most of the times, the things that uh, other people are far more responsible for than, than I am. Um, one of the things I did learn is a general approach. And uh, one of the things is early involvement. Uh, there's a tendency for, for, for people to say, eh, well, maybe if I wait, this, thing's gonna, this problem is gonna go away. Or it's gonna resolve itself or someone else is gonna come in and, and resolve it. Um, doesn't, doesn't always happen that way. Um, so one of the things that I've always tried to do is to, when an issue comes up, to try to research it and to contact people who are far more knowledgeable, like some of the people in, in this room, uh, about those issues. So um, you, can, you can deal with it. And being an ex-social studies teacher uh, for 32 years in the Middle Country School District, um, I like to keep my members in the Wading River Civic Association and in the community informed uh, and to do it, you know, in a fairly accurate uh, manner. Uh, I depend heavily on, on the opinion of people who know much more than I do, not only uh, the data, the science of it, but also how do you get this across? What what strategies uh, should be used. Um, and boy, we've been blessed on Long Island with a lot of really uh, great people who are not only credible environmentalists, but they're tremendous strategists. And, uh, you know, uh, people like Dick Amper, people like Bob DeLuca, uh, not people like Mark, no, no. never, never, no. You don't pay any attention to what he said, no. I'm just the, the moderator. The moderator, just another pretty face, yes. Uh, so another thing that I we found helpful uh, in, in a lot of issues is coalition building. And, um, you know, Wading River um, is an unusual village, in, or not your typical village in the sense, even though we're an unincorporated village, we're in two townships. We're in both Riverhead Township and Brookhaven. Uh, we're a big part of Riverhead, but we're a tiny, teensy, weeny bit of, of Brookhaven. So we've had to deal with uh, all, all of those issues. Um, I've been active in uh, civic coalitions in, in Brookhaven, such as the affiliated Brookhaven civic organizations. And um, 
uh, toward the east in groups like the RNPC. Um, uh, one of the things also that, uh, you know, the other than the side, there's a political side of it. Uh, I see like, dealt with people over the years who I greatly admire, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Al Krupski, I saw his name, uh, you know, on, on your list, is very, very high on my list. Um, I certainly miss someone like Senator Ken Laval, his involvement. I don't know how many issues that, uh, you know, he was just great on. Uh, you know, he could really make things uh, happen. Um, the um, Another thing is, uh, I think it's important to, you know, one of the uh, speakers said about not demonizing your, your opposition. And I think there's a tendency, the developers, right? Yeah, you know, right? Yeah, pooey developers, right? Uh, uh, you know, these are people, okay? Uh, they have different ideas and, uh, uh, and as someone pointed out, it's, it's the ideas, et, et cetera, rather than as, as, as people, as human beings, that we, we shouldn't be attacking. Um, uh, so um, what do I regret? Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I, I see as a, as, as a failure is even after all these years of being involved in civic groups and my own civic association, the ability to kind of like attract a, a, a fresh influx of new people who want to get involved and not people who either pat you on the back and say, good work, Sid, keep it up. <laughs> you know, what that usually means is I'm too busy in my personal life to get involved in this you know, or you take care of it. Um, so, you know, but then again, I don't, you know, I uh, look back in the last 50 years, I didn't get really involved in this stuff until I was in my early 40s. And it wasn't for the most noble reasons that I became involved, but environmental reasons, I became involved in, in, in the Civic Association. We wanted to change the school district boundary in Wading River. And someone said, hey, why don't we join the Civic Association? We can get the Civic Association support. All right, that's not very uh, noble, but that's the sad but true story behind me. Um, another uh, thing that um, failure, I don't know, and I haven't navigated this very well, is I found out that conceptually, uh, a lot of people will, including myself, accept certain environmental ideas. Solar energy, it's good, all right? But then again, when it comes down to saying, where should solar energy go and in what form? Nah, no, nah, I don't want it, you know, I don't want it, or that's, that, that's wrong. And um, so, uh, it, sometimes the environmental causes, which are very, very important, energy issues, et cetera, uh, you know, are, are more complex. And we haven't, at least I, and a lot of people I know, haven't thought very, very much about the implications of what this is going to mean in the future. So I hope the young folks coming up were smarter than myself and, and Mark. Especially Mark. No, just speak for me. Just speak for me. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'm done. Oh, that's the cue. Okay, our last uh, our last gig is with uh, we couldn't leave out Dick Amper. And if you read the caption down below, you'll see what we're fighting when it comes to progress in town. Don't worry, the farm in front of Pulaski Street will never go away. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'd like to play his. Um, I'd like to play the interview I did. And if my panelists could listen to the second part of these, it's very short, it's about seven minutes. He's a one take wonder. And listen to the question that I gave him about the, the 55 gallon drum with $1,000 bills in it. 
And I'm going to ask everybody one at a time, what would you do with that barrel of money? Oh, sorry. Wrong button, dude. Sorry, I'm creating breakout rooms by accident. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> oh, it's good to see, see you. Um, I realize I've been working with people for two years without being in the same room with them. I know the feeling. Uh, How's it going? Uh, it's going well. I, I, I really appreciate your being here with us today, Dick. Um, especially with the 50th anniversary of NFPC coming up. Uh, That's an important occasion. I, I'm delighted to be a part of, uh, of their work. You guys. You're on mute. I realize I've been working with people for two years without being in the same room with them. I know the feeling. Ugh. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. I, I, I really appreciate your being here with us today, Dick, um, especially with the 50th anniversary of NFPC coming up. Uh, That's an important occasion. I, I'm delighted to be a part of uh, of their work. You guys have done a, a, a whole lot and have been partners uh, hand in hand for, uh, for decades and it's very, very much appreciated. Well, we're looking at uh, our list of partners. I was putting them onto a slide to use for this presentation and realized uh -huh. I need a second slide because <laughs> of people like you. So um, we appreciate you too. Just uh, quickly for the audience, Dick, can you uh, just give us a quick uh, bio, and like a two-line bio, and where you're at? Oh, sure. Um, I moved out uh, of New York City and to uh, Lake Panamoka um, at the eastern end of uh, Brookhaven Town um, in 1972. Um, within 10 years, we were seeing pressure to develop, and the development was in one case specifically um, on the northeast uh, corner of Lake Panamoka, um, roughly 60 acre uh, uh, body of water. In any case, um, neighbors came to the house and said there were people who were going to develop this property, many acres, and it would be moving constantly to the southwest and would destroy the lake completely. Um, so that's sort of how we met one another. And we said, well, what are we going to do? I knew nothing about um, individual purchases of lands and so forth. I just took it for granted. I came out in 1972 at a beautiful lake at my doorstep. And a lady came from across the street and said, we've got a problem here, Houston. <laughs> and, uh, wow. and, and what they said, determined was that there was a political person, somebody in political office, who was going to develop that land in exactly the way that the woman had been born. And so we began to scratch our heads and say, what can be done? Surely this is not something that's automatic. And the answer was, no, it wasn't. There was a whole lot to be done. And the fact of the matter was that most of the land in the a core preservation area of the Pine Barrens was under siege. It was in danger of, there were 240 separate projects proposed for this land. And so we immediately said, okay, we've got a way bigger problem than we thought, and we need to come up with a, a very much bigger attack. And that's where uh, North Fork comes in and uh, so many other groups, a uh, total of uh, more than 230 uh, uh, groups. And they said, no, let's make that fight. And that fight lasted for 40 years, uh, but it, result, it resulted in the preservation of $2 billion um, dollars worth of, of, of land, um, covering more than 100 acres 
of um, pine barrens. Um, we still think we have 3,500 um, that still need to be, to be concluded. Um, so we're, we're not done yet, but, but the overwhelming result was um, people who cared about this stuff volunteered. We had literally dozens of volunteers working, moving into Brookhaven Town Hall and working there night and day to address this and have it attack in a responsible way. And we began to win legal battles uh, one at a time. And we ultimately ended up with uh, with uh, a total of about 106 acres in the pine barrens. We think there's 2,500 more to death. But what has been accomplished has been absolutely amazing. It, it, it was the cost to buy it was $2 billion. And the thing that was really interesting is the public supported it. They weren't with, objecting to a 1% increase in this. We're in favor of doing this and they ultimately put the money up to do this to everybody's delight and we're now and i want to say mopping up operations but we've got a paradise that we'd have lost if it hadn't been for your group and, and others like it so uh, what i'm hearing without asking the questions i wanted to ask was all the answers you just gave me so it's coalition it's grassroots it's getting the citizenry involved. It's getting the, the the language into the conversation. Absolutely correct. That's exactly what the challenge is. And it took a long time to get it done. You had um, 235 property owners who said, we're not, we are going to build on this land. And we said, no, you weren't. And we went back and forth. And uh, we won in the court system. Um, all the way up to the Court of Appeals, at which point the uh, government said, we're not going to get involved anymore. So we took the uh, developers up to Albany to meet with the assembly and, and Senate leaders and so forth and saying, let's agree, you can do this there and we can do this there. And they approved a law that was 100% supported by the legislature. Wow. It was an amazing accomplishment, just amazing. So if we were to bring this out, I, I, I'm looking at the Plum Island Coalition. I'm looking at the Conagestory Partnership. Uh, we've got those people on this, uh, on this presentation today as well uh, with, with the same big picture, uh, with the same... And that's the way to go. And, and you've got some good people working that project. Yeah, we're, we're pretty excited. They, they, these people are experts. I'm a generalist and I'm, I'm the first to admit it. And that's okay. Um, we, we, get, we need some generalists. <laughs> But getting people into the room, uh, coalitions and, and roundtables of, uh, of not just the enviros anymore, it's, it's bringing the social aspects in. It's bringing the economic aspects into all of this as well. Um, I know, are there two Pine Barrens, one in New Jersey and one here? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so... And, and, and there's one in, in, in uh, upstate New York, and there, there, there are a, okay. a bunch of smaller ones. But... Um, but the, the one in New Jersey is gorgeous. And, and the trouble we're looking at, of course, is the pine bark beetle. Um, I don't know if that's an embarrassment or, or frightening or all of the above. Um, can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, that, that, that was basically the way development was moving from south to the north. And sooner or later, these little buggers were going to arrive. And um, we're making a, a, a significant headway because this, this property is so valuable to us, so that we're putting many resources into the protection of that body. So uh, my, my final question, Dick, is, is um, if I gave us, gave us a barrel of thousand dollar bills, what would we do with them? Well, we want to finish up getting the, the 3,500 <laughs> 3, acres we we, we know we're still out in the core the, the core and core preservation area and compatible growth area. Uh, we want to get those things done. And then we're going to continue to do that. There's controlled burns. There are all kinds of things that require us to be on our toes and making sure that we're preventing things that shouldn't happen from happening. So that's going to take a long time. The public is enormously, absolutely enormously supportive. What can we do? How can we help? 
and it was just an amazing thing to see happen. I know the uh, the issue of water quality has always been an issue, and the Pine Barrens is a big component of our aquifer. Um, we're also starting to talk about water quantity, and um, maybe you can address that briefly for me. It's it's the next frontier. There's no question about it. I mean, the the, the public knows they are. You've got a constituency, um, especially on the North Fork, that says we need to protect this resource, and we're going to see more and more of that. And we should. All right. I, I don't want to take up more of your time, Dick. I appreciate your time so far. I'm, I'm honored that I was included in the event. Um, the, the North Fork Environmental Council has been a stalwart in saying this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it right. And we're going to do it, uh, uh, well, not just right, but perfectly. And you're doing a wonderful job in anything we can do to continue this relationship. Have us in. I really appreciate it, Dick. And I know uh, we're going to get a lot of comments on this. and. Uh, I will be in touch and I would wish you well. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've uh, done a lot for us too. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you everybody for watching all of that. Uh, Dick, it did answer the, uh, the barrel of money question. And because I'm dealing with scientists, every one of you took the what worked, what didn't, and what next. You've already addressed all that. So we only have that one short question left. We should have anticipated the process in everybody's braids. It's so great. Um, just briefly, uh, just the one around. Um, Debbie, barrel money, what are we doing? Okay, so um, I travel to Maine every summer. I've been doing that for about 40 years. Um, I visit the Mount Desert Island Acadia National Park area. Um, they have been faced with um, terrible, terrible, terrible traffic issues um, between tourism, residential use, uh, lots of businesses on the island. Um, they actually were able to take a really good stab at solving this problem. Uh, they worked with a consultant and through a public private partnership were able to um, develop a transportation management plan that incorporates public transportation um, along with clean energy. So I would love to put that money towards um, working with possibly that same consultant to uh, be able to solve our traffic problems, incorporating public transportation, which is way overdue, uh, and clean energy on the North Fork. Thank you. I noticed Al Krupski's taking notes about what he's going to do with that barrel of money. <laughs> Thank you, Al. It was tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Gwyn Schroeder, barrel of money, so, what are you doing? Well, I'm not sure how much a 50 gallon barrel of $1,000 bills is, but I would probably um, divide it up and half I would probably dedicate to land preservation and um, shovel ready projects and probably the other half I would um, give to um, advocacy groups so they can strengthen themselves because if anybody that's ever worked for a nonprofit it's always about how much money and what kind of resources you have and so um, so half of it would go to immediate right here and now issues and uh, the other half to like supporting groups. All right, thank you. Louise, barrel of money. Well, my barrel of money is huge. I'm looking at limitless resources um, to buy up natural ecosystems, but also to, to wage the biggest media campaign the world has ever seen. Um, <clears throat> to try to cut us all back on on this, on our dominant culture lifestyles that are so dependent on carbon emissions and hazardous materials and exploitation of natural resources. I'd like, to, it would have to aim it at where people are today, uh, engage people at that level. That's what media campaigns are good at, I'm not. Um, but it also has to involve um, indigenous communities. Right. Dr. Novak, Joyce, barrel money. Barrel money, I would change out every septic system and cesspool um, in the watershed. Um, that's what my barrel of money would buy me. 
Uh, since it's unlimited, I would also aim to remove as many hardened shorelines um, as were possible. Um, as I do think, uh, I agree with Kevin McAllister that, that that's a heartbreaking uh, loss that we all face. Um, but I think what we need most, the money can't buy, right? Um, we need to prioritize making decisions together and we need courageous leaders um, to stand by really, really unpopular and tough decisions because that's what they're there for, to make the tough decisions. That's excellent. Thank you, Joyce. So we'll be talking again. Um, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> unrealistically, uh, it would, the barrel of money would go towards eminent domain of waterfront properties to ultimately control uh, <laughs> hardening as well as uh, institute buffer zones. But now on a realistic perspective, um, and I, I remember speaking to Senator Laval about this at the round table several years ago. Um, the state of New York is crying out for a legitimate independent audit looking at the Department of State and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Department of State crafts uh, coastal policy, DEC administers it. And there's a real disconnect. And quite frankly, um, the regulatory structure is failing us. So if we had outside eyes on these two agencies, uh, you know, really getting in and, and a, a deep dive as to, you know, their uh, effectiveness of policy, are they adhering to, you know, what is supposed to be? Uh, and, you know, I see that as the only corrective action uh, for those, you know, that particular agencies. Wow, that's very, um, that's a real thing. Um, Sid Bale. Uh, can I take the money for myself? Absolutely. I just, I just asked oh, what you're doing. Okay. I didn't say it's an option. Good, do good, good. Uh, I think uh, what I would like to do with the, the money, I would like to assist the state in uh, finalizing the purchase of the 800 acres around the defunct Shoreham nuclear plant, uh, which they are supposedly in the process of, of doing. And that would extend the Pine Barrens region. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of property. And uh, I would like to see, there are two historic homes on the property, uh, the Woodhull House and the Tuttle House. And uh, they could be centers for uh, uh, a lot of good environmental <laughs> education activities. I've heard education a lot tonight, which is really in our wheelhouse as far as the NFEC is concerned. Uh, media campaigns, coordinated efforts, um, I'm, I'm very, um, very much for that. We've all talked about education and eco literacy or becoming literate about the ecology or the environment. Um, we are gonna be pressing that this year. I've got uh, two more slides, yes. Uh, one is uh, from TNC, can you see that? Is that up? No, it's not. How about now? Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah. I, I, it's not mine. I have to say it's the Nature Conservancy, and I absolutely loved it. I pulled it like two years ago. Didn't, ha didn't know how to use it quite yet. Today's the day. Uh, some of the uh, language uh, that's coming out now is the difference between ego-logical and eco-logical. And I'll be using those uh, going forward as we, as we, oh, you didn't see it yet. Wow, well, let's try it now. There we go. High tech, thank you, Bill Gates. So we're gonna be using these language, these parts of language in our, in our presentations uh, from now on. And uh, thank you, TNC, for that. Uh, let's go. Um, how about Debbie? Welcome our new board member. I know we did, we're gonna do it again. Uh, you, oh, I'm yeah. Sorry, I, so you'd like me to welcome Lisa? Yeah, and also press, press for new board members. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we are always looking to increase the capacity as all of our organizations are, um, be it um, volunteers, um, uh, board members, um, financial supporters, um, members. So yes, um, just a call for um, all of the above. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, thanks. Um, all of this drove me to realize that there's 10 more people that we could have asked on tonight. And I'm looking to do part two. I don't know if it'll be in February. It's only 
four weeks away, so we'll see. Um, upcoming events that uh, Margaret DeCruz and I and Lisa Gavallis. Uh, welcome, Lisa. Where are you? I'm here. All right. Lisa came to us after what I'm considering our worst webinar on the planet about two months ago, and we said we wanted to start a repair cafe, and she emailed us, and she is actually knee-deep at this point in helping us with social media and a few other things. Uh, Lisa, do you have a word or two? Sure. Um, certainly compared to all of you, I am a nonprofit newbie. I've spent 35 years in the corporate world running marketing and digital for various uh, retail companies that you've all shopped at. Um, and so what I bring to the party, hopefully, is a way to help grow the base. Because what I do know, um, the three things that work in corporate will work here, which is finding great people, showing them the North Star, and then helping them figure out how to help. And we can do that. The North Fork Environmental Council can do that for the North Fork. So please follow us. We just changed our name on our Instagram to North Fork Enviro. If you don't follow us, please do. We will be collecting all great things that are happening on the North Fork and making sure that the word gets out to lots and lots of people. Um, super looking forward to it. It's very exciting. It's like the 20, 19th, 18th century coming alive here. Very excited. Uh, Debbie, you want to talk about the run? We know when it is yet? Um, actually, I think that's Dawn's. Um, oh, cue. Dawn, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is Sunday, April 24th. Okay. Uh, it's always been a success. So we, I think we missed it last year, but uh, we'll be outdoors and doing it this year. Um, as I mentioned a few times during the course of this evening, I'm, I'm, I've got the uh, seeds of an idea for an environmental roundtable, and that would include all of you and probably another 15 or 20 more beyond that. We're talking about coalitions, so that's in the planning stages, and any input that you have, uh, be glad to have it. I mentioned that uh, Sid and I are working on the comprehensive plan for Riverhead right now. It's a tough slog. There's a lot of um, a lot of work to be done. Thank you, Southhold, for having done yours already so I can copy and paste into ours. We are doing a food waste reduction and diversion. We've done our two pilot programs, one for education and reduction, and the other one in an actual fill the bucket with your food scraps and bring it to the town transfer station. That was exactly a year ago this week. Um, we're going to be looking for volunteers and uh, people who are interested. You don't have to be experts. I'm not, like I said, I'm not an expert. But we need people on an external green team to make the town of Southold climate smart community work become legal and, and actual and start gathering points. And Margaret, you're up on the repair cafe. I didn't know I was going to be up, but um, yeah, we're going to be doing our first repair cafe. And I believe we have a date to do it in the Greenport Library on Saturday morning, March 27th. I don't know. I don't remember the exact date. 26, 27? Somebody know? Around there, the last week of March. Last Saturday of March. It's the, the week Good. after spring began, begun, begins. So, and a repair cafe is really to help people reduce waste, stop throwing away things that can be fixed and that are valuable, and grow mm -hmm. community and skill people. Uh, um, like reskilling actually is the word this is from the transition town initiative where uh, older people and people with skills can help younger people learn how to use their hands and tools and fix things you know fix furniture fix their toasters fix their jewelry fix their you know the buttons on their coat um, and so people bring things to fix and then we have coaches who help people fix things and we have tools and it's fun and it grows community. So it mends bonds along with mending clothes. That's one of the things that I like about it. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna be on the Drawdown Festival this weekend on Sunday. The Repair Cafe will be a, a pretty good segment of that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about zero waste, circular economy and quite a few other things. I knows Karen Bloomer's on tonight and Mike Madigan, uh, Partners in Crime and the taking a lead on zero waste, which is going to be um, announced uh, at a much higher level very soon, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, anybody from the board like to make a final comment? 
Okay. <laughs> I do. I will. Yes, yes I'm please. A new, I'm one of the newest board members, and I'm so impressed by what you guys have done in the last 50 years. It's amazing. So congratulations. And here's to the next 50. Thank you, Gwyneth. <laughs> thank you, Angela, and everybody else I know on this call. Thank you very much for your time tonight. It, will, it has been recorded, and we will be putting it up on the YouTube channel. Uh, for people like uh, Kevin, uh, who are interested in using your segment for uh, promotion, I chop these things up. So I would send one, you know, Allison's piece to Allison, the link for each of your segments individually, so you can use them in the future for promotion and whatever you need them for. All right, thank you very much, everybody, and have a great night. Stay safe. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Good night.